So if you thought that the first reading was weird, <laughs> you ain't heard nothing yet. The gospel reading is taken from the infancy gospel of James, and just a little bit of background to it. <clears throat> this is a document that comes from about 150 AD. So although it's not contained in the legal canon of scripture, it's a very, very ancient tradition. They found literally hundreds of copies of this document, you know, in tombs all over the world. And was translated into many, many languages, including Irish. <clears throat> so I remember as a small child, hearing these stories from my great-grandmother and wondering where the hell did she get them from? I never heard them in church, but she had all these stories. So this is from the infancy gospel of James. And it's, it's the middle of a story, and I'll fill in the story later on in the homily to you. The Lord be with you. <laughs> a reading from the infancy gospel of James. Mary was in her sixth month when one day Joseph came home from his building projects, entered his house, and found her pregnant. He struck himself in the face, threw himself to the ground in sackcloth, and began to cry bitterly. What sort of face should I present to the Lord God? What prayer can I say on her behalf since I received her as a virgin from the temple of the Lord God and I didn't protect her? Who has set this trap for me? Who has done this evil deed in my house? Who has lured this virgin away from me and violated her? The story of Adam has been repeated in my case, hasn't it? For just as Adam was praying when the serpent came and found Eve alone, deceived her and corrupted her, so the same thing has happened to me. So Joseph got up from the sackcloth and summoned Mary and said to her, God had taken a special interest in you. How could you have done this? Have you forgotten the Lord your God? Why have you brought shame on yourself? You who were raised in the Holy of Holies and fed by heavenly messengers. But Mary began to cry bitter tears. I'm innocent. I haven't had intercourse with any man. And Joseph said to her, Then where did the child you're carrying come from? And she replied, as the Lord God lives, I don't know where it came from. And Joseph became very frightened and no longer spoke with her as he pondered what he was going to do. And then he said to himself, If I try to cover up her sin, I'll end up going against the law of God. But if I disclose her condition, I'm afraid that the child inside her might be heaven sent, and then I'll end up handing innocent blood over to a death sentence. So what should I do with her? I know, I'll, I'll divorce her quietly. But when night came, a messenger of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take this girl because the child in her is of the Holy Spirit's doing. She will have a son and you are to name him Jesus. The name means he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph got up from his sleep and he praised the God of Israel who had given him this favor and he began to protect the girl. The gospel inspired by God. All great Irish stories start with a formula, and the formula goes like this: We far on for the law, goes for the the we, and goes she and we are now. It's the formula. The problem is, there was a man in it a long time ago, and it is a long time ago since he was in it, and the name that was on him was, and then they name him, and then they tell the story. So I'm going to start like that today. Vi fær om fadå, agus fadå de vi, agus jen tannum a vier, na midzir. There was a man in it a long time ago, and it is a long time ago since he was in it, and the name that was on him was Midir. Now Midir was a prince and a king of the Tuhad de Danon. The Tuhad de Danon were a mythological people who were the first inhabitants of Ireland. And they were displaced in a great battle by an invading group called the Milesians. And the Milesians came in and defeated the Tuhad de Danon in two great battles at a place called Mautiri. And so the Tuhad de Danon had to abandon the countryside. So they shape shifted and they began den denizens of the under the mountains and under the ocean. They downsized literally in size and they lived under the 
mountains and great crystal palaces, and they lived under the ocean in a place which had two names in Irish. Sometimes we call it Tir Fahaun, which means the land under the waves, and sometimes we call it Tir Nanog, the land of the eternal young, and it's the original Atlantis. And so the two of the Don shapeshifted and lived in these places. And a king of, one of theirs was a guy called Midir. And Midir was married to a queen who was called Fuamnach. But he fell in love with another girl, the most beautiful girl in fairyland, a girl called Itzain. And he fell in love with her and he married her as well. Polygamy was allowed in the Tuatha Dana. As you can imagine it, Fuamnach wasn't very happy with this arrangement. <laughs> and so she went to a druid and she put a cast a spell on Itzain. And she turned Itzain into a butterfly. And then she sent an extraordinary wind to take her out of the palace and take her away. And this little butterfly is flying all over Fairyland. And finally she lands in a house, the house of Angus Nanon. He was a, a, fairy, a fairy god called Angus of the Birds. And he recognized a fellow, fellow denizen even in butterfly form. So he protected her for many, many years. <coughs> he offered her protection. And he built a beautiful garden with many different kinds of flowers. And she lived in the garden on these flowers. But eventually, Fuamnach got to hear of this, and so she sent an extra strong tempest that blew her completely out of fairyland into the human kingdom of the Malaysians and uh, people above the ground. And she is buffeted about with this wind, and finally she's driven in to this big banquet hall and lands on a rafter just like this, over a banquet in the house of the King of Leinster. And the King of Leinster is having this big, big, big banquet, and he's sitting at the top table with his wife and all his warriors, and they're having a great time of it. And this little butterfly is perched in the rafter, and she's so tired from her travails that finally she falls off the rafter and plops right into the cup that the queen is drinking from. And the queen doesn't notice it. And she drinks it down, butterfly and all, and lo and behold, nine months later, she gives birth to a little girl. And this little girl is so pretty, she calls the little girl Itzain, which is interesting because that's the name she had when she was the fairy king. The queen didn't know this. So this little girl grows up, and she's the most beautiful girl all in all of Ireland. And one day, the king of Ireland spots her, and he falls totally in love with her, and he wants to marry her, and indeed they do. And they get married, and they marry just for a few months. And once a year, there's this great big festival in Ireland called the Festival of Tara where all the kings of Ireland come together and the High King hosts it and it goes on for a week and there's feasting and there's jousting of all kinds and there's wrestling matches and there's sword fights and there are chess competitions. The ancient Irish played chess. It's called Cleha Fihala in Gaelic. And so just a few days before this begins, Etain is out with her maidens and she sees this warrior coming towards her on a white steed. But seemingly nobody else can see it except her. And the warrior comes towards her and it is Midr from the Tuhadadanan. And he says to her, I want you to come back home with me. You are my wife. And she has no memory. She has no idea who this guy is, what he's talking about. So she says, I'm the, the queen of Ireland. I'm married to the king of Ireland. What are you talking about? He says, no, no, no. You're my wife. You're a fairy princess. You belong in Tiernanog. And something is beginning to stir her, but she's really discombobulated. And she flies back into the castle. So the big feast begins. And the first day of the feast, Midder comes again on this white horse, right up to the high king of Ireland. And he challenges him to a chess match. Now, the King of Ireland is the acknowledged world champion, Kasparov Pidand. He's the world, world chess champion. So they have the chess match, and he beats Mither. And Mither says, OK, I've been beaten. What, what do you want? And the king says, I want a bag of gold. So Mither goes back to his horse to a saddlebag, and he lifts off a bag of gold and schleps it up and gives it to him and disappears. Next day, the second game of the festival, Midr comes again, and he challenges the King of Ireland to another chess match. And they play the second ch chess match, and the King of Ireland wins the second one. And Midr says to him, what do you demand? He said, I want two bags of gold. So he goes back down to his saddlebags and schleps up these two bags of gold and gives them to the king. The third day of the festival, he comes again, and he challenges the King of Ireland to a chess match. And the king says, OK, let's go for it. And this time, Midr beat him, and everybody is shocked. The king had never been beaten. And so the king says, OK, fair is fair. What demand do you have? And Midr said, I want one kiss from your wife, Yitain. And the king is really, really shocked. But he can't break his word, so he says, OK, but not today. You have to come back in a month's time, and I will grant you your request. 
So the month is up, and the king has the whole territory surrounded with his troops, and the whole castle is surrounded with his troops, and they're inside the big banquet hall, and the banquet table is surrounded by the troops, and they're all armed to the teeth, and they're waiting for Mither to come to pick up his prize. And the door opens, and Mither comes in, it's late at night, they got all the torches, they're all lit, and everybody starts standing around, fully armed, and the king said, search him, make sure he's not armed. And they search him, he's totally unarmed. He comes in, and the king says to him, remember, you get one kiss, and that's it. And so he comes right through, and he puts his arms around Mither, his arms around the chain, and he puts his lips on her lips, and all of a sudden, she remembers completely who she really is. And her heart goes out to him, and suddenly all the torches go out. There's this wind comes, and all the torches go out, and there's bedlam inside, and there's rattling with spears, and the door opens, and they rush out, and everybody rushes out, and all they see is two white swans flying across a full yellow moon. And she's gone back to Tiananog, to her beloved. So I'm going to start with that place today. And I want to talk about <laughs> immaculate conceptions and miraculous conceptions and strange conceptions. Because we find them all over the world. We find it in this great Irish myth of a butterfly that impregnated a woman that gave birth to a princess. We found it in the first reading today from the book of James. So what I'm going to do is, for maybe half an hour today, just call the theologies of the world and the histories of the world and the mythologies of the world and the scriptures of the world for evidence and stories of these extraordinarily strange conception. So I'm going to talk, it's going to be a long morning. <coughs> I'm going to draw stories from the Anunnaki and I'm going to draw stories from Genesis chapter 6 from the, the Nephilim. And I'm going to draw a story, I'm going to talk about Noah and I'm going to talk about um, but the Buddha and Lao Tzu and Alexander the Great and then I'm going to make up a few stories myself at the very end and then just throw the whole lot at you and say, there you are, figure it out, make sense of it. So the first one from the Anunnaki. According to the Sumerian legends, the Sumerians are the first civilization. Their writings go back to about 3,800 BC, so almost 6,000 years of age. And they were the civilization that gave us many, many firsts. They gave us mathematics, they gave us astronomy, they gave us map making, they gave us literature, they gave us uh, double story buildings, they gave us transport of various kinds, they gave us kingship, they gave us temples, they gave us priesthood, they gave us law, they gave us marriage, they gave us divorce, all these things. They gave us all these firsts. And what they said themselves was that they didn't invent any of these things. That they got all of this wisdom from a group of extraterrestrials whom they call the Anunnaki. And their story is that 445,000 years ago, a group of extraterrestrials came onto planet Earth to mine the planet for gold that they needed to repair their own atmosphere. And they landed in the Persian Gulf, and they began to mine gold, originally literally out of the Gulf waters, and then they ran out of gold, and they transferred the operation to South Africa, and they had to dig in the mines. And they dug mines in South Africa to get gold. But after some stage time, this was really back-breaking work, and they revolted. They didn't want to do it anymore, and so one of them, now these, the, the Sumerians called these guys gods with a little g, because they came, they were extraterrestrials, they seemed to live forever, and they were extraordinarily wise beings. So one of, them, one of these gods, a guy called Enki, decided to manufacture a slave species. So he took ape woman, and he took eggs from ape woman who was on the planet, and cross-fertilized it with semen from Anunnaki males, and then mixed it together in a special way, and there's an entire protocol in the writings of how it was done, implanted the result in the womb of an Anunnaki woman, and then delivered it by caesarean section and created the first Adam. Adam, and we get a kind of version of the story in the book of Genesis. So that they manufactured a slave race, which is Homo sapiens. So you take Homo erectus and the Anunnaki, and you cross-fertilize them, and the result is Homo sapiens. Going back about, according to them, back about 300,000 years. Now it got a little bit more complicated because at some stages, the Anunnaki males began to fall in love with these human females. And they began breeding with them. So now you've got demigods. So you've got a spectrum at this stage. You've got pure Anunnaki, and you've got pure human beings, and then you've got demigods, one of whose parent is divine, and one of whose parents is human. And then if you've got a demigod, you know, breeding with real god, there are three quarters divine and just a quarter human. And so there's a whole spectrum of bloodline. So that's the Anunnaki story, that they crossbred with us. 
And there were various kinds of these gods. There were some of these gods who never came to earth. People like Anu, the, the father god. And then there were those gods who were born someplace else, and they came to <coughs> earth, and they lived on earth. They lived long, long, long lifetimes, 500,000 years, according to the legends. But they died as well. So they came from elsewhere, but they landed on planet Earth, and they lived here, and they finally died here. That's the second group. And the third group were gods who were born here. So both of their parents had come from elsewhere. They were both gods. They had their kids here on planet Earth. So these gods are born on planet Earth, they live on planet Earth, and they die on planet Earth. And then there are the demigods, one or other whose parents is divine, but is born on planet Earth and lives on planet Earth. And according to the Sumerians, there are four phases of kingship. Who's ruling planet Earth? Firstly, the Anunnaki, the gods who came from elsewhere, they ruled it, planet Earth. And then the second group was those gods who were born on planet Earth, they ruled it. And then thirdly came those demigods who were born on planet Earth of a divine parent and a human parent. And then finally, the fourth group to rule planet Earth were human beings. So we're just the fourth in the lineage of those who rule planet Earth. So that's the Anunnaki version, that this was literally a genetic cross-fertilization. It was a medical procedure, you know, in which you got various levels of uh, gods impregnating human women. So that was the, that's the Sumerian version of it. Genesis chapter 6 has the Hebrew version, a kind of a watered-down version, and it goes like this. Genesis chapter 6 says, the sons of men began to proliferate on the planet. This is after God has created them in his own image and likeness. The sons of men begin to proliferate on planet Earth, and daughters are born to them. And the sons of God find the daughters of men very attractive. And so they take them to wife, as many as they want themselves, and they give birth to a giant race that are called, they're given two names in the Bible. They're called sometimes the Anakim, which is straight out of Anunnaki, and sometimes they're called the Nephilim. And Nephilim in Hebrew means the fallen ones. And so it was regarded as a fall that gods were breeding with mere mortals. And so in Genesis chapter 6, you have this story that there's this cross breeding happening. And the word that's used in Hebrew, it says, the sons of God. Found, found the daughters of men, tovot. And tovot in Hebrew can mean either beautiful or lovely, or it can mean compatible, I mean, literally, uh, biologically compatible, that they can breed together or copulate together. So that's the story in Genesis chapter 6, that whoever these sons of gods are, they're not, they're extraterrestrials in some way, they're not humans, and they're breeding with human women, and the result is a race of people that is called the Nephilim, and they're giants. And this group still is alive at the time of Moses. There's a great story in the book of Exodus where when the Israelites are trying to go into the new land of Canaan to conquer it, they send spies in. And the spies come back and says, there's no way we can take this land. The people in this country are giants. To them, we look like grasshoppers. And they lose heart, and they go back into the desert, and they wander around for 40 years. So in actual fact, in the Hebrew scriptures, there are about 10 different references to this race of giants that lived in olden times. So there's the book of Genesis, chapter 6. There's what he had to say about it. Fast forward a few thousand years to about 11,000 BC to the story of Noah and the flood. Now, the story of Noah and the flood that we find in the Bible is just another version of a much older Sumerian myth. The Sumerian myth, myth the character and the hero is called Ziusudra. And when that myth was translated from Sumerian into Akkadian, he's given another name. He's called Utnapishtim. And so there's three different names on this character. And the Sumerians call him um, Ziusudra, the Akkadians call him Utnapishtim, and the Hebrews will call him Noah. And as well as books of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, there's lots and lots and lots of writings in Sumerian, in Akkadian, in Babylonian, in Assyrian, and in Egyptology about this event and this character. They give them different kinds of names. But basically the story is this. So there are a few books as well which are extra scriptural. Uh, the last book of Enoch and the last book of Noah talking about the story in much more detail. They're not, in, they're not included in the Hebrew scriptures or the Christian scriptures. But the story basically is this. Enoch was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah was the, the oldest man who ever lived. He was 969 years when he died. Methuselah was the father of Lamech, and Lamech was the father of Noah. And Noah is the hero in the story. 
But when Noah was born, his father Lamech was really, really upset because he didn't look a bit like him. Literally. He had this extraordinary glow, and the kid was born speaking. Literally speaking. He had language skills at the time of birth. So um, the daddy is really, really upset. Lamech is really upset. And he accuses his wife, I don't know what you've done, but this is not my child. You've been mating with a god. And she claims, absolutely not. I did not. This is your child. So he's so upset, he goes to his own father, Methuselah, and he says, give me some advice here. You know, is this my child or not? And Methuselah says, you know, that's beyond me. I'm going to have to consult with my daddy. And he consults with Enoch. Now, Enoch is one of only two people in the scriptures, we're told, that never died. There's a list of the patriarchs, and they all live to be eight or 900 years old. But when it comes to Enoch, it says, Enoch lived 365 years, and then he was taken up, and he walked with the gods. All the others were told, you know, he lived to be 969, and then he died. He lived to be 754, and then he died. He lived to be 920, and then he died. Only of Enoch, as it said, he lived to be 365, and then he was taken, and he lived with the gods. He did not die. But he's available to his son, Methuselah, and Methuselah figures out, can you give me some advice? Uh, my son is really upset that his son is not his son. So can you, can you help me out here? You know, the story according to the, the, that book then is that um, Enoch averes that he actually is the son of Lamech. But there is this tradition in the, in the Roman tradition, in Roman cosmology, in Greek cosmology, and in many other cosmologies, that the gods sometimes breed with women, and they do it in one of several ways. They either force themselves upon human women, or they seduce human women, or they hypnotize human women, or they disguise themselves completely and they look like the, the woman's husband. And she's totally convinced she's making love to her husband and she's actually been impregnated by a god. And this is very, very strong in many, many different cosmologies. And so um, Lamech is convinced this is actually what's happened. He's convinced that his wife is innocent, she wasn't <coughs> unfaithful, but that she was actually, that he was cuckolded. He's raising somebody else's child. So, at this stage in, in world affairs, the gods are really, really upset. The gods who haven't come to planet Earth are really upset that the gods who have come to planet Earth are interbreeding with this slave race called human beings. And they're determined to wipe out the experiment completely. They're really, really upset. And you find this in the Hebrew scriptures. God repents that he'd ever created human beings, and he decides to send a deluge. And they're borrowing completely from the Sumerians. And so the decision is, the gods who have not come to Earth are going to wipe out the whole show on planet Earth and start from scratch again. But one of the gods, a guy called Enki, who's actually the father, he's the one who actually cuckolded or gave birth to Noah. He's determined he's going to save his own kid. Even though this kid is a demigod, he's not fully divine because his mother is, is a human being, he determines he's going to save, to save him. So he whispers the secret to him that the gods intend to wipe out the whole thing. I want you to build a ship, and he gave him specifications. And in the Sumerian version, it's not a boat, it's a submersible. Literally, literally a submersible. So it's um, a submarine. And he tells him he's not putting two of every kind of animals on the boat. He's taking their DNA. And this is said specifically in the, in the, in the essence of the Sumerian writings. They extract the DNA of all living things on planet Earth, and they hold DNA in the submersible so they can uh, reinvigorate the planet afterwards. And then the deluge comes and wipes everything away. There's only Noah and his wife and his three sons and their three wives, eight people, and they'll start the experiment from that again. But in the meantime, the gods have gone in their spacecraft, according to the Sumerians, and they're watching this deluge just wipe out all of civilization. And finally they see you know, literally bodies just floating in rivers and whatever, and they begin to repent. And they come back down and they're distraught. And then they discover that this human being has escaped and that Enki has been responsible for it. And they figure out, OK, he's meant to survive. And then they give us agriculture. They teach us agriculture. And they teach us how to domesticate animals. And now you have what appears to be the beginnings of civilization. But this is just the beginning of this round of civilization, according to the Sumerians the scriptures. So there was a story from, uh, that's the story of the, of the flood. Go forward to the story of Abraham. So Abraham lives about. 1850 BC. And the story of Abraham is, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees, which is Sumeria. His father was a priest in the temple of one of the Anunnaki gods, according to the Sumerian liter literature. Now, Abraham follows another one of these gods into the land of Israel, a god called Yahweh. And he follows him to this land, but Abraham doesn't have any kids of his own, and he
and his wife Sarah is barren and she's over, she's almost 100 years of age and she doesn't have any kids. And then one day, three angels, three messengers, three gods, three Anunnaki, whichever word you want to give to them, depending on which scripture you're reading, they come to visit. And they say, we understand you don't have any kids. And uh, Sarah's sitting inside in the tent listening to the conversation. And they say, we'll come back this time next year and your wife will be pregnant. And she starts laughing inside the tent. And they say to her, they say to him, why did she laugh? <laughs> and she sticks her head up and says, I, I, I wasn't laughing. I, don't know, I, had kind of, I was coughing. So she's really embarrassed. But next year, she gives birth to a child. Now what has happened? These three gods, angels, messengers, Anunnaki, what are they? Did they do some kind of genetic you know, tweaking with her biochemistry so that at the age of 99, she suddenly got pregnant and she gave birth to a child? And the name she gave to the child was uh, Itzach. Itzach means I was laughing. But that's the name of Itzach. No wonder she was. She's 90 years old. She's given birth to her for a child. Wouldn't you laugh? <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you wouldn't. So, uh, so that's about 2000 BC. Come back down to other traditions then. Take the story of Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu is the great um, uh, uh, inventor of the, uh, this beautiful system, the Tao Te Ching, or Taoism. He flourished about 600 years before Christ. The story in Taoism is that Lao Tzu was conceived by his mother and carried in her own womb, hang in there, wait for this one, for 600 years. <laughs> she carried him in Utro for 600 years. Imagine having 600 years of morning sickness. Okay. That's according to the Tao Te Ching. He's carried in Utro for 600 years before he's born. And when he's born, he's, no, he's a wise old man already, uh, even as he's born. Move forward another 50 years to a different tradition, to a Buddhism. And the story within Buddhism is that the Buddha's mother had a dream in which she, her side was pierced by an elephant's tusk. An elephant runs at her and pierces her side. And she, she hasn't, she's barren at this date. And she gives birth to the Buddha 10 months later. So again, there's some kind of an extraordinary, miraculous <coughs> conception of this extraordinary child. Come down to about 350 BC. And this is a very interesting story. Alexander the Great. Alexander lived in Macedonia, in Greece. And at this particular time, for about 150 years, the Greek, the land of Greece, was being totally overrun by the Persian Empire from, from the east, from modern day Iran. For about a 150 year period, the Persians conquered the known world. And they, they came into Greece on a regular basis and they despoiled the, sti the city states. And the city states of Greece were very disunited among themselves. And then about the year 360 BC, uh, there was a king called Philip of Macedonia. And Philip managed to organize the city-states of Greece to kind of fight back against uh, Persia. But the Persians had devastated them again and again and again. Now Philip gave birth to a child called Alexander, who we call, would be known as Alexander the Great, probably the greatest military genius of all time. His strategies are still studied in the military schools all over the world, including our own here in the States. He was never beaten in battle. So Alexander now becomes the leader of the city-states of Greece, and they start fighting back against the, the Persians. And he crosses the Hellespont with narrow portion of land, dividing Turkey from Greece. He crosses with an army of 15,000 people. And the Persians see him coming. But they decide not to attack him in the water, to let him gain foothold on the land so they can surround him completely and totally wipe out his, all his forces. They figure if they attack him in the sea, they'll kill maybe a thousand or so and he'll retreat with the rest. Let him come into Turkey, they can surround him and wipe out the entire 15,000 people. And they have an army of 40,000 40, arrayed against him. Alexander won the battle and he defeated them and the Persians begin flying towards the east and he followed them for a little bit and then Darius who is the Shah in Shah, the king of kings of Persia, he comes against him with a huge big force and Alexander defeated him again and now Darius, the Shah in Shah, the king of kings, has to flee toward Babylon. But Alexander did a very, very strange thing. Instead of following Darius and you know, driving home his advantage and conquering the kingdom, he turned south completely and he headed down into Egypt. Now what is the story? Why did he give up this opportunity for pursuing Darius and going down to Egypt instead? So here's the story you find in the Greek history. 
there was a story that Alexander's father was not Philip, that his mother had been impregnated by a, an Egyptian pharaoh who had come visiting to Egypt. And uh, Alexander wanted to know if this was true or not. And so he consulted the oracle at Delphi. And the oracle at Delphi told him that he needed to visit, there was a similar oracle in a place called Siwa in Egypt. He needed to go to Egypt to check out this story to see or not whether it was true. And so it was more important to Alexander to find out who his real father was than to pursue Darius. And so he goes southwards instead of eastwards. And he consults the oracle in Siwa. And she tells him, yes, indeed. Your father is not Philip. Your father is Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra is the, one of the gods of Egypt. Ra means the sun god. Amun means the one who is no longer visible. And the story was that this god, who'd been uh, uh, an Anunnaki a chieftain in Egypt, wanted to become the lord of the whole world. And so he headed off to Babylon to, to conquer the Middle East. And he's known in Egypt as Ra. And he's known in Sumeria as Marduk. And so the Egyptians called, began to call him Amun-Ra. And the word Amen, actually, in our prayer, comes from that, that name. And Amun means the unseen one, because he'd now spent literally hundreds and hundreds of years absent in Sumeria trying to conquer that area. So he's told, Alexander is told, your father is Amun-Ra. Your father is Marduk. And now with that news, Alexander starts heading, heading towards the east. And once more, Darius is uh, lined uh, at the river, the river Euphrates, waiting for Alexander to come. And Alexander does an end run, comes right around behind him, crosses the Tigris, and comes in behind Darius, and totally defeats Darius, and conquers the city of Babylon. And he's welcomed into Babylon, because Babylon had been conquered by the Persians. It was a different empire. And he wants to meet his father, Marduk, only to find out that Marduk, who had lived for about 500,000 years, has just very recently died, and he's shown the body. <laughs> and the body is preserved, it's mummified, and it's in some kinds of oils, and he gets literally to touch his own father's body. And then he goes on to conquer over to the gates of India. So again, you have this notion that Alexander himself is a demigod. His father was a god, not just a mortal like, like Philip. Which brings us right down to the great stories of the Christian Bible. So what's the deal with Jesus? Well, it depends again you know, which scripture you're going to read. You're going to read Matthew's account, you're going to read Luke's account, or you're going to read James' account this morning. So the notion somehow is that Jesus has a divine parent and a human parent. You're beginning to see a pattern here? This is an old, 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 old myth. It's not, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying it's an old, old, old myth, that there's a divine parent and there's a human parent. So according to Matthew's account, um, Joseph and Mary are betrothed to each other. But before they come to live together, Mary is found to be with child. And Joseph is really, really upset. And so he determines he's going to divorce her quietly. He's not going to make a fuss out of it. He's just going to let go and divorce her. And then, after he's made this determination, an angel comes to visit Joseph. An angel, who is this? Extraterrestrial, Anunnaki, I don't, what, what word do you want to give to it? Somebody comes and says, don't put her away, because she's conceived what is in her by the Holy Spirit. Some other being than a human you know, has impregnated Mary, and therefore the child she's carrying is a demigod, or a god, or different from the so protector. So Joseph gets up, and he takes Mary as his wife, and we're, uh, Matthew is very, very careful to say he did not have intercourse with her until she gave birth to her firstborn. So that was Matthew's account of it. Luke's account of it is that it's not Joseph who has the encounters with the angel, it's Mary who has the encounters with the angel. So in Luke's account, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Blessed are you among women, you know, you have found favor with the Lord. Now, who is the Lord here? Is it Yahweh? Is it Marduk? Is it the ineffable source of all that is? It, some non-terrestrial being is going to take responsibility for impregnating this woman and saying to her, and you'll give birth to a child, and I want you to call this child Jesus because he's going to save his people from his sins. And uh, Mary acquiesces, says, OK. And then the third version we just read this morning is from the infancy gospel of James. And this is a much, much more evolved story. It's a long, long, long story. I don't have time to go into it. But just to comment on today's version of it, according to this version, Mary herself was born immaculately. Her own parents were barren. 
Her mother was called Anna, and her father was called Joachim. They didn't have children. There was an intervention from outside, and her mother got pregnant, probably not through Joachim. And they promised that because of this gift, they would raise the child in the temple in Jerusalem, that she would not be raised by them, she'd be raised in the temple. So at age three, she's given into the temple to the priesthood to take care of. And she lives there for about 12 years. But then she's coming into puberty, and she's going to be menstruating, and you can't have a menstruating woman in the temple. So they decide she has to be taken out of the temple, somebody has to look out for her, and they hold a kind of a contest to find out which man in Israel is fit to look after this virgin, because she must stay a virgin. And very reluctantly, Joseph wins the contest. <laughs> very reluctantly. Joseph is an old man, he's a widow, he's got grown kids, and he doesn't want anything to do with this, but he comes to the meeting, and the deal is, every man must put his staff on the ground, and the high priest is going to pray and determine which of these men is going to be responsible for taking charge of the virgin. And he goes back to the staffs, and he notices all of a sudden, when Joseph gets his staff back, a dove comes out of the, out of the staff and lands on Joseph's head. <laughs> and the high priest says, you're the guy. And Joseph says, you've got to be joking me. I'm a building contractor. I'm an old man. Everybody's going to laugh at me. I'm going to take this little girl. She's a 15-year-old girl. You've got to be kidding me. And the high priest says, you have to do it. God has chosen you to be the protector of this little girl. You must protect her virginity. So that's the background to this story. So Joseph takes her home. He's really unhappy. He's got kids who are older than her. And he says to her, look, the kids will look after you. I'm a building contractor. I've got jobs to do. I'll be away for the next few months. And he goes off on a building safari. And today's story picks up. He comes back after six months, and he comes in, and she's got a big belly. <laughs> He's really freaking out. He was given charge to look after this little girl and to keep her a virgin forever, and now you know, somebody has, has um, destroyed her. And you heard the story today. He's really upset. How could you do this? You were chosen by God specially. How could you do this? And she says, as God, I, I have no idea how it happened. No idea. And just says, did somebody come into you? Was one of my sons? Was, no, no. I have no idea how this happened. And finally, Joseph is told by an angel that it was the Holy Spirit. Some extraterrestrial entity has impregnated his wife. And he agrees to raise this child. So again and again and again, you have this extraordinary story that uh, the gods interbreed with us, and special children are created in this special fashion. Now, I'm going to make up two. I'm going to tell you one scenario, a modern one, and make up a final one, and then rest my case. <laughs> no, women take it the verb. Okay. Yeah, They're, well, that's it. If you want to discuss that, we can discuss it. There are, there's the goddess called Ishtar, or Inanna, yeah, who was a tough cookie, who seduced guys left, right, and center, and carried kids for them, and then outlived them because she was a goddess. She lived for five or six hundred years. The guys died after 50 or 60 years. So she took a whole slew of other guys. So if you want to get into that story, we can get into it. But in the meantime, just a few years ago, there's a, a woman in Italy. She's married. She can't have kids. She's really upset. And finally, they make an arrangement where her own mother, who's in her 60s, donated her womb. They harvested eggs from the daughter, cross-fertilized it with the sperm from the husband, implanted the fertilized egg inside the grandmother's womb, who's in her 60s. She carried it for nine months, and then she's delivered by cesarean section. So that's an interesting kind of a conception. And, uh, a birth. So that's a real story from Italy two or three years ago. Now, finally, I'm going to make up one for you. Imagine Mary, I don't know, wrong, wrong name, Kathleen. <laughs> is married to Steve. They're a young, young couple. They're just, you know, barely out of their teenagers, deeply, deeply in love, and they're committed to getting married. And they're both virgins. They both you know, kept themselves for each other. But just a few weeks before the intended wedding day, Steve has a motorcycle accident, and he becomes a quadriplegic. <clears throat> but they love each other so much, they decide to go ahead and get married anyway. And they get married. But obviously, they can't have kids in any kind of a normal way. But they manage to harvest eggs. They manage to harvest sperm from Steve. And they harvest eggs from Kathleen. And they cross-fertilize them. And they implant them in Kathleen. And she carries it for nine months, and then they deliver her by cesarean section. Now, in this case, Kathleen is a virgin before, during, and after giving birth, which is exactly what's claimed for Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she's a virgin before, during, and after giving birth to Jesus. So it's not unthinkable 
that somebody could be a virgin before, during, and after, after birth. And I say, there's a whole bunch of it. I'm throwing them all out to you there. So how much of this is fact, and how much is fiction? How much is mythology, and how much is scripture? How much is faith, and how much is symbology? So if you're real kind of gullible, you may think it's all fact. Or if you're sophisticated, you may think it's all fiction. Or if you're really open to the possibility, maybe it's part fact and part fiction. Maybe sometimes the truth is much more interesting and much more complicated than the stuff we make up. Okay. Namaste.